Welcome back to the Critmatic Podcast. I'm your host, Dominic Wallenzak. And this week, we're going to talk about fentanyl exposure amongst emergency responders. Now, this is a topic that's been coming up in the news uh, fairly recently. A number of organizations have posted about uh, different exposures that have occurred to their personnel, and news media have covered the story in depth as well. But what's the actual science behind these exposures? Is there a risk to providers? Stay tuned, and we'll cover that in just a little bit. So when we talk about fentanyl exposures, we're usually talking about the context of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. Uh, usually not one of the medicinal grade fentanyls, it's usually some sort of alfentanyl or uh, sous-alfentanyl uh, variant uh, that's part of the manufacturing process of heroin. And uh, these different fentanyl analogs are often left in and sometimes included in as a cheaper and simpler alternative uh, in the manufacturing process of uh, heroin. So these pose a certain problem to EMS personnel as all drug exposures do. But uh, it might not be quite as drastic as a lot of the news media reports uh, purport it to be. So we're going to talk about fentanyl and the blue plague, as I have called it. So uh, fentanyl is, uh, is uh <clears throat> you know, something that's found in a lot of these medications and a lot of these uh, drugs that people are taking. Now, I want to just disclaim this a little bit. I have a lot of respect for my colleagues in law enforcement. They do a difficult job and oftentimes a thankless job. So I don't want them to feel that I'm putting them down. That's not really the case and that's not the aim and ob the objective here. The aim and the objective here is simply to educate and to cover a lot of ground about what the actual dangers are to providers and how they should respond. So I don't want anyone to think that I'm bashing law enforcement because that is not my intent, far from it. Uh, I want to educate and put this information out to everybody so that hopefully uh, we can avoid uh, some of the issues that tend to crop up. So what are some of the uh, symptoms that tend to present when we have someone who has a overdose or some sort of exposure? When we think about our opioid toxidrome symptoms, uh, there is usually a set of symptoms that are fairly characteristic of opioid overdoses. And those are somnolence, bradypnea, bradycardia, hypotension, cyanosis, and pinpoint pupils. Nothing else really is, is considered part of the, the opioid toxidrome. It's strictly those items. Uh, generally feeling unwell and uh, a little bit of dizziness. Well, dizziness might be a slight side effect, but it's not part of the toxologic toxidrome that presents in opioid overdoses. So let's take a look at another set of symptoms that I want uh, you all to uh, see here as well. What are the symptoms of anxiety or panic attack type symptoms? That consists of sweating, tingling, some loss of especially peripheral sensation, uh, chest pain or palpitations, nausea, headaches, dizziness, uh, trembling, loss of vision. People can actually lose their vision from being that anxious and that worked up. And uh, speech problems as well. Uh, this is referred to as a globus hystericus. It's a condition where you're so worked up that you lose the ability to phonate, to the ability to speak. So these are a lot of the, the symptoms that present in a panic or anxiety attack. So I want everyone to keep these two sets of symptoms in mind as we review a couple of incidents that have cropped up. So this is just a handful of the incidents. There are actually far more incidents than I'm just listing here. Uh, I think at last count, just the ones that have been prominent, there's been about 60 to 70 of these news reports of these sorts of, sorts of exposures. So I'm only going to cover a couple highlights of a couple of noteworthy ones. Uh, so a couple of the ones that we're going to talk about are ones like this one. This was down over in Texas, uh, Harris County, if I recall exactly, where a uh, sheriff sergeant uh, was reported to be hospitalized uh, by supposed fentanyl-laced flyers 
uh, some group called Targeted Justice put some flyers uh, underneath the windshield wipers of uh, some patrol cars. Now, their objective was to inform uh, the deputies and law enforcement uh, about a situation that they perceive where some sort of mind control rays or s some really crazy kooky conspiracy theory, but they wanted to alert law enforcement to that. Uh, however, so this uh, deputy found this flyer underneath her wiper, took it into her vehicle, started driving for a bit, felt uh, unwell, felt dizzy, felt palpitations, and uh, they decided to test the flyer after she got some medical assistance. And the field test kit came back positive for fentanyl. Now, I just want to put out a word about the field test kits. Uh, unfortunately, the field test kits um, have a really high instance of false positives. Anything from the glazing off a Krispy Kreme donut has been tested positive for different drugs. Uh, so it's not an accurate test. In fact, uh, I believe a ProPublica study on it that was published in New York Times showed that it had a 70% false positive rate. And sadly, this is often used as the basis for criminal convictions of people. Uh, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're going to talk about specifically what happened to this death beauty. Now, unfortunately, the news media only knows two terms, rushed to the hospital and hospitalized. I mean, if we take someone normal traffic for a stubbed toe, well, that person was rushed to the hospital by ambulance and hospitalized. In the medical setting, when we're talking about hospitalization, we're talking about admission to the hospital, not just being seen in the ER. Anyone can get seen to the ER. It actually takes a little bit of work to get admitted because they have to meet some sort of medical necessity in order for insurance companies to actually pay out. Uh, so being hospitalized is not the same thing as being seen in the emergency department. But so far, it seems like a legitimate, you know, exposure. She had a, a flyer. Uh, she took it into her vehicle. She started feeling some symptoms, um, and it tested positive. Well, except for, uh, oh, uh, this was also what was put out by the Sheriff's County office here. Uh, the flyers were placed on the windshields of some Harris County Sheriff's Officer vehicles this afternoon at uh, 601 Lockwood and have tested positive for opioid fentanyl. One sergeant who touched a flyer is receiving medical treatment. Call authorities if you see these flyers and do not touch. So that was actually a tweet put out by the, the sheriff's office as part of their official statement. That's all well and good, except for a couple of days later, it turns out uh, that none of this was actually accurate. So they tested a total of 13 flyers. And uh, of these 13 flyers, none of them tested positive in an actual lab for fentanyl. In addition, the uh, clothing items, blood, and urine samples collected from the uh, sheriff's sergeant who reported symptoms had no fentanyl on them or in them whatsoever. So she had no exposure to no drug, yet she felt tingling, dizziness, impaired vision, and headache. Now, let's think back for a second. Do we remember seeing those particular sets of symptoms listed earlier? I, I think so, and I don't think that one was particularly in the opioid overdose category. So let's move on. Another instance, 18 Pennsylvania cops hospitalized after possible fentanyl exposure. Uh, they were uh, assisting some federal agents uh, from the uh, U.S. Post Office and uh, I believe it was uh, ICE as well uh, that was doing uh, some raids. And during this raid, some Pittsburgh officers were exposed to a chemical and uh, they uh, experienced some symptoms. Now, there's something very interesting and peculiar about these. Uh, if you'll note, no federal officials were affected. Hmm. Wow, that's, that's crazy how nature does that. It only affects one particular police department, not the other departments that are also there on scene. Nature's crazy. So there's also this listing that has been compiled. Uh, Dr. Jason Kodat has been putting together a list of all the news reports of the various uh, supposed fentanyl exposures. And actually, a lot of them are 
proving to have a lot of negative markers, such as the least affected, uh, the most affected person was the least involved in the actual patient care or in the scene. It's funny how a lot of these supposed exposures don't include the suspects who have been in direct contact with whatever supposed substance there is. So there's been lots of instances of the supposed exposures, 66 plus and counting, that, that we're keeping track of. I think this will actually make a good study. I mean, if you can study how many times resuscitation was successful in a, a TV series, uh, then I think you could probably easily do a study to see how many of these news reports of fentanyl exposure are actually exposed and actually fentanyl. So moving on, uh, what what's happening then? If it's not fentanyl, then then what could be causing this? Well, there's a couple of things that come to mind. For one, conversion disorder, uh, mass hysteria, anxiety panic disorder, and some other psychosomatic effects. Now, let's take a look at them systemically here. So this is a news report of a conversion disorder instance that was occurring actually not too far from me over in Leroy. Uh, this is about an hour drive away from me out in the outskirts of Rochester. And uh, apparently 12 female students from a junior high school uh, started to experience some symptoms, some really peculiar symptoms. Uh, these symptoms included uh, twitches, stuttering, included some syncope. Uh, I think there were seizures mentioned in there as well. Now, when you hear these symptoms, you think, wow, that's, that's really concerning for possibly some sort of neurologic event or some sort of neurotoxin that's present. Maybe we should test the entire building. Maybe see, see if there's some sort of presence of neurotoxins here that's affecting these poor children. Well, they did test the, the building, and they weren't able to come up with anything. These students went to Dent Neurologic Institute, which is a major neurologic clinic here in Buffalo, and uh, ran some tests. And after ruling out all the other possibilities, the eventual diagnosis that they came up with is these students are suffering from conversion disorder, which is sort of a mind-over-matter type of uh, situation. Let's take a look at another one here. Here's an instance of mass hysteria, the dancing plague of 1518. I'm sure maybe some of you EMS dinosaurs might recall this one. So the dancing plague is uh, took place, I think it was outside of Strasbourg, Vienna, but I can't remember exactly where, where about 400 people danced for days without rest. Uh, some, you know, ultimately died from exhaustion or strokes or heart attacks or you know, getting trampled to death by the mass of people who just continuously can't stop dancing. Uh, it's a, actually a fascinating read if you want to check it out on Wikipedia. So the dancing plague is uh, something that they found is related to some uh, psychosomatic sensory input and neurologic condition. This is uh, something that manifests in a spread from person to person where someone sees someone dancing, thinks they're afflicted, and thinks that their proximity is now going to cause them to be afflicted as well. And as such, they feel that they can't stop dancing. And consulting the, the experts at the time, uh, they felt that the best option would be to build more dance halls. Because maybe if you can dance and get it out of your system, you can not have a desire to dance when you get hit by the dancing plague or, or something along those lines. Well, actually that sort of backfired. It kind of drew more attention to the entire uh, you know, mass hysteria and more people became afflicted with it. So that, that didn't turn out too well. I guess the other ideas for treatment of this was uh, bloodletting, which I would posit is probably an effective treatment for that. I mean, if you bleed someone until they're hypotensive, I mean, they probably can't dance anymore. Uh, it's maybe not the best way to go about it. Uh, but I've heard of crazier ideas, so that, that seems like it might be a uh, probable option. So let's take a look at another possibility here. Anxiety attacks. I'm sure that almost all of us EMS providers have experienced a patient with an anxiety or panic attack. And some of us may even suffer from those as well. So I won't really belabor the point about anxiety attacks and, and their symptoms and treatment, 
but uh, I think we've all encountered this, we've all seen it, and we all know that even though this situation might not be immediately life-threatening, it feels very real and very life-threatening to the person who's suffering from it. So the last one here is a mass psychogenic illness. And it's all, these are all shades of kind of similar uh, pathophysiology, especially neuropathophysiology. And this actually has a study done on it that lists a lot of the common reported symptoms. So according to the study, the common reported symptoms were headache, dizziness or lightheadedness, nausea, uh, some abdominal pain, coughing, fatigue, uh, sore burning throat, you sometimes hear that uh, in different situations, hyperventilating or difficulty breathing, irritated eyes, watery eyes, chest tightness, palpitations, pain, uh, can't think, vomiting, tingling, anxiety, some trouble with vision, and maybe even loss of consciousness. Uh, does this sound familiar? Does it sound like some of the symptoms that we might have been seeing in some of these news reports? Hmm, that, you know, could very well be. So, uh, there's something else to keep in mind. That could be another underlying cause for what is actually going on, what's transpiring with these events. So, what does the science say? What is the science behind this? So, I, I just want to preface this with saying that I am no expert, okay? Uh, look at that guy in the picture. Does that look like someone that you can trust with some deep-down science knowledge? I I know a couple of things. I can read studies. I can discuss studies with uh, with anyone intelligently, but when it comes down to it, I am not a subject matter expert on a lot of topics. I am a paramedic, like most of you. So, what do the experts say? Where can we find the experts? So, who are the experts on this field? Well, that would be these guys. The American Academy of Clinical Toxicologists and the American College of Medical Toxicologists. Uh, toxicologists are the people that deal with exposures to, well, toxins. These are the guys that uh, do all the studies on um, exposures and they also put out guidelines for how to treat different drug and chemical exposures. If you think about advanced hazmat life support, these guys, as well as pharmacists, those are the guys that run the AA. AHLS course and programs. So these people are well regarded as the subject matter experts on this topic. And they say that fentanyl and its analogs are potent opioid receptor agonists. But the risk of clinically significant exposure to emergency responders is extremely low. To date, we have not seen reports of emergency responders developing signs or symptoms consistent with opioid toxicity from incidental contact with opioids. Incidental dermal absorption is unlikely to cause opioid tox toxicity. Now, keep in mind, this was just put out recently. This is after the whole mass, you know, opioid overdosing from first responders was first reported in the media. So, they're aware of those instances. and They're saying that those aren't really consistent with opioid toxicity. Going on to the physician statement, they also say, in the unlikely event of poisoning, naloxone should be administered to those with objective signs of hypoventilation or a depressed level of consciousness, and not for vague concerns such as dizziness or anxiety. A lot of those officers that uh, you read about administered themselves some naloxone because they felt some numbness or some tingling. Uh, naloxone is primarily meant for reversing respiratory depression that's associated with opioid toxicity not for the general malaise. Incidental dermal absorption is unlikely to cause opioid toxicity. If bilateral palmar sur surfaces were covered with fentanyl patches, that means uh, both sides of your hands, it would take uh, approximately 14 minutes to receive 100 milligrams, I'm sorry, 100 micrograms, 100 milligrams would be a lot, 100 micrograms of fentanyl uh, using a body surface area formula that's uh, too long to go into. This extreme example illustrates that even a high dose of fentanyl prepared for transdermal administration cannot rapidly deliver a high dose. The above calculation is based on fentanyl patch data, which overestimates the potential exposure from drugs in a tablet or powder form in several ways. Drugs must have sufficient surface area 
and moisture to be effectively absorbed. Medicinal transdermal fentanyl utilizes a matrix designed to optimize delivery, whereas tablets and powder require dissolution for absorption. Relatedly, powdered drug sits on the skin, whereas patches have adhesive to hold the drug in close proximity to the skin, allowing both to remain moist. Finally, the above quoted figure uh, represents delivery at a steady state after the drug has penetrated the dermis which overestimates the amount of absorption in the first few minutes of dermal ab ab exposure. This initial period is of most relevance in unintentional exposure because fentanyl that is observed on the skin can be rapidly removed by mechanical means, such as brushing it off, or cleansing with water. Therefore, based on our current understanding of the absorption of fentanyl and its analogs, it is very unlikely that this small unintentional skin exposure to tablets or powder would cause significant opioid toxicity, and, and if toxicity were to occur, it would not develop rapidly, allowing time for removal. So what that means is fentanyl is something that can be absorbed transdermally. The absorption, though, is very small. In fact, after fentanyl was developed, it actually took years of development and research to come up with the fentanyl patch in order to get effective delivery of fentanyl transdermally. This patch has special additives and special adhesives and a special structure, uh, all designed to actually optimize the delivery of the drug. Uh, fentanyl is not something that easily moves through the skin on its own without being wet or having some sort of solvent along with it. So that's why they have to do all this research and come up with a way for, for fentanyl to really move through the tissue. And it takes a while for it to actually start to move through and get into central circulation. Uh, if you take a look at a fentanyl patch, the actual dosage or the actual concentration of how much fentanyl there is on a fentanyl patch, uh, the amount is quite significant. Uh, the amount that you actually get into your system is relatively low and relatively small. That's because it, it, that's because it takes a long time for it to go through the skin. It's not an effective and rapid means of delivery. This is not your intranasal fentanyl. This is transdermal. It's going to be slow. Just like transdermal nitroglycerin, the administration and absorption is slow and inconsistent at best. Transdermal fentanyl is, you know, sometimes uh, not the greatest means of delivery. So, uh, mucose, mucose membranes present opportunities for absorption of fentanyl and its analogs. Fentanyl, for example, exhibits greater than a 30-fold absorption across mucous membranes when compared to skin and is available in a formulation that utilizes transmucosal administration. What this means is that fentanyl actually absorbs fairly well, especially like into the mucous membranes of your nose, of your eyes, or uh, of your rectum. Uh, granted, that's not probably a popular route of EMS administration. but these um, mucous membranes can easily absorb the fentanyl and is actually an effective means of administration. So that's something to keep in mind. However, that's not the end of the story. The, uh, the paper actually go on to cite uh, a veterinarian who uh, got sprayed in the face by 1.5 milligrams of carfentanil from a uh, carfentanil blow dart. Uh, I guess they must have had some sort of uh, <coughs> therapeutic misadventure uh, in the sedation of an animal, and the vet got sprayed in the face. So he started to have some symptoms, and he had uh, some drowsiness, and uh, became uptunded. So they gave him naltrexone, and all was better. 1.5 milligrams of carfentanil is an exceedingly high dose. Uh, it's, uh, it's meant for large animals, uh, such as elephants that's well in excess of what the human dosage would be for that same sort of uh, medication. In fact, we don't even use carfentanil for humans because fentanyl and other fentanyl analogs are far more effective and uh, in a lower, uh, I guess in a higher uh, dosage than carfentanil where you talk about nanograms for human dosage. So, yeah, they mentioned that in their position statement, so don't get into your eyes or into your other mucous membranes. So there's some videos that I want to show you here as well. 
this one is by uh, Chad Sabora and uh, Dr. Sarah Stato. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that, so I apologize if I'm uh, mispronouncing your names. This is actually from a longer video by them where they talk about some of the effects of, uh, of fentanyl and how it gets into the heroin that's being used. Uh, Dr. Sarah uh, is actually a uh, neuropathologist and pharmacist PhD, and Chad is actually a uh, recovering addict who's now running an outreach center. So let's take a look at the video here, and uh, we'll see just... Uh, substance we just tested, tested positive for fentanyl. Now, if you saw me, I opened up that capsule, so I already had dermal exposure. Um, so if an overdose was possible for touching it, it would be happening. But just to make this a little more pronounced, Now, if I'm shaking a little bit, I'm not nervous, I'm in recovery, and this is the first time I've had this much heroin around me um, in about seven years. All right? Uh, and a monster on the way here. So as you can see, I have fentanyl on my skin. I'm experiencing no signs of toxicity, no overdose symptoms, nothing whatsoever. Okay? Um, I don't know what else to do. We showed it was positive for fentanyl. It's on my skin. It's sitting there, and nothing is happening. Yeah. So. I mean, I think it's important also to realize that the police and the first responders that have reported exposure, they've experienced symptoms like increased heart rate, you know, irregular breathing, Just our vision, which vision is our dizziness, things like that. But those things aren't necessarily indicative of an opioid overdose. No, they're indicative of panic. Though. Yeah, and so it's more indicative of panic and then there are cases similarly where they've given Narcan to these people and then they feel better and again it's just kind of like a uh, did you read the case of police officers that they, they self-administered Narcan to themselves? Yeah you can. Yeah, when you overdose like you're, you're at a you, point where you need it you can't self-administer. Yeah there's no respiratory depression my breathing is fine again you cannot overdose and touch a Narcan. Um, any questions feel free uh, this either be on the news or be posted on social media Feel free to ask. Um, thanks for watching. I apologize for the uh, potato quality of that video. Uh, I know that filming in vertical mode is uh, considered a bit of a, a sacrilege in the uh, internet world, and uh, the uh, the pixel count on that video was uh, a little bit lacking. But the message is still there. That test that he did registered positive for fentanyl. So he took this powdered heroin and fentanyl and laid it right out on his hand. And there were no effects. He didn't go unresponsive. He didn't get any sort of loss of sensation and dizziness and general malaise type symptoms. Uh, that's not really what he ended up experiencing. Uh, his symptoms actually weren't present. This was all just uh, powder that remained on the skin. So it has very marginal transdermal absorption properties, especially if it's just a powder that's put on temporarily. So it's relatively safe. Uh, so it's not something that you immediately have to be concerned about as long as you use just proper protection. So if you want to take a look at the whole video, I, I, I'd encourage that. It's actually fairly good material. The link is down at the bottom there. So there is another video that I want to share with you. Uh, this one is uh, put out by the government. Uh, it's actually put out by uh, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, uh, but it's actually something that is uh, actually has done as a joint project with a total of 10 federal agencies and has endorsement and buy-in from the National Association of EMS Physicians and, well, pretty much every group that's a stakeholder. You'll see at the very end of the video. But uh, this shows a good reenactment demonstration and some information for all first responders. So let's take a look. What do you want? Just give me one. That's enough. Oh, I wonder what's going on here. Let's go ahead and light them up. He's going out the window! Clear the room! I got a gun. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that's becoming more and more prevalent in the drug world. It's actually more potent than heroin or morphine, 
and even some of its analogs, such as carfentanil, are much more potent than that. Fentanyl has been seen in powder, tablet, capsule, rock, nasal spray. The forms are always changing. What we've seen in the last few years with fentanyl is a rise in the number of deaths associated with its use. First responders are increasingly likely to encounter fentanyl in the line of duty. We want to make sure that they have the facts to keep them safe. I got this on my hands. Well, one myth is that just touching any amount of fentanyl is likely to cause severe uh, illness or injury or even death. And, and that's just not true. Incidental skin contact with fentanyl. Hey man, what's going on? Fentanyl can be washed off with soap and water. Wash your hands. You'll be okay. You think? Yes. All right. You don't want to use hand sanitizer because that can actually potentially increase the absorption of fentanyl. Exposure can come in many ways through skin contact, through the mucous membranes of your mouth, or your eyes, or the most significant risk is from aerosolized airborne powder. Another myth is that PPE or personal protective equipment won't protect you from fentanyl. And the truth is that in mo most circumstances it will offer a, a significant level of protection. And gloves will protect from the skin exposure, skin contamination of your hands. The respirator mask will, will prevent the inhalation of an airborne powder. Wearing eye protection can prevent the exposure through the, through the mucous membranes of your eyes. Hey, can you check her breathing? All right. Ma'am, are you all right? Hey, can you hear me? Should someone become exposed to fentanyl, uh, some of the signs or symptoms that you would see would be drowsiness or unresponsiveness, slow or no breathing, and then constricted or pinpoint pupils. Those are the signs or symptoms you want to look for in yourself or in your partner or in someone that you're responding to. She's not breathing. Better call EMS. 960, Hotel 16. Hotel 16. Yes, can you get EMS on the way to 301 Jasper Street, room 250? Send an EMS to 301 Jasper Street, room 250. They're on their way. If you think you've been exposed to a substance that could be fentanyl, you want to take that very seriously. You want to alert a supervisor or a buddy, tell them what you think is going on, and the first step is to prevent any further contamination. The second step is to not touch your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Uh, that way you'll prevent further exposure. Uh, third step is to simply wash the area with soap and water. And then finally, if you think your clothes or, or some of your protective materials have been exposed or contaminated, you want to remove those through your standard decontamination protocols. More and more first responders are being provided with naloxone for use in the line of duty. You want to administer the naloxone per your established protocols. Naloxone is a very safe medication and it can very rapidly and effectively reverse the effects of fentanyl and it can be life-saving. How are you feeling? Okay. Having any trouble breathing or anything? No, I did get a little on my uh, skin accidentally. I washed it off with soap and water though and then gloved up. Okay, well, check your pulse real quick. Okay. The threat of fentanyl is real, but we're showing a multi-layered defense that will keep first responders safe while they do their job and keep the rest of us safe.
So if we all took a look at all the agencies and all the organizations that participated and endorsed this particular statement that was put out. Uh, so this has huge buy-in and uh, has a lot of information that's uh, beneficial. This is not the full video. This was just some excerpts from the video. So the link that you saw earlier, that will have the full thing and actually has a lot more information in there for uh, providers as well. But I just want to highlight the point that if you get it on your skin, just wash it off. That's all you have to do and you'll be fine. And uh, if you encounter, say you get called to the scene for someone like a police officer who encountered some fentanyl and is overly anxious and overly concerned about their exposure, be professional. Reassure them and explain to them what's going on and uh, you know, take their concerns seriously. This is not the time to really argue with them about, about the science and pharmacokinetics of everything. Uh, because they're probably in a state where they don't want to hear it. They are just so uh, excited and perturbed about their experience. And uh, our, our job is to provide reassurance and comfort. And eventually, once they realize that their symptoms aren't progressing and you're not, as a provider, freaking out either, uh, they'll be able to calm themselves down and uh, they'll get back to their normal baseline. So just make sure that you provide calm, passionate professional care like would with anyone who's experiencing an anxiety crisis. So check out the full video below, the link's down at the bottom. So where does that leave us? What does this all mean? Uh, let's just break it down to something simple. What is the summary of recommendations? Well, based on the current knowledge of fentanyl, the summary is this wash hands. Don't be nasty. If you, if you touch it, wash your hands. Wash your hands before you eat and don't touch yourself anywhere until you wash your hands. And that sounds like common sense, but sometimes it just needs to be repeated. Just wash your hands if you get the exposure. Wash your hands before you eat anything so you don't transfer anything, plus whatever disease of the day that you're carrying around with you on your hands. Just make sure you wash your hands and practice good hand hygiene. Glove up. Regular nitro gloves are perfectly fine. There's a company that's trying to uh, cash in on the whole fentanyl hysteria and making fentanyl resistant gloves, which means pretty much any set of gloves that are available. Uh, they say, oh, well, this, this is uh, just a little bit thicker too, so it's, you know, extra resistant, even though regular gloves are perfectly resistant to it so this is extra perfectly resistant to it so I guess I can't fault the drug companies not drug companies I can't fault the um, manufacturers and uh, uh, suppliers of trying to cash in on this uh, there's there's some real fear and there's a demand for some products to to help assuage that fear and if there's a market for it Someone will try and cash in on it. That's that's just the way of, of business. So mask up. You don't need an N95 on every single call. But if you think there's a likelihood that you're going to get airborne or aerosolized uh, contaminants or particles, uh, then it's a good idea to mask up. You don't need to have an SCBA. I saw a news article about a police department that that called the fire department to the scene and, and borrowed their SCBA to, to suit up and, and go in and do a, a search of this one premises. That's not really necessary. And to be frank, if you're not trained in the usage of that equipment, you don't really belong using it. So in this particular instance, you don't need to have an SCBA. You don't need to have a, a powered, uh, you don't need to have a papper. You don't need to have anything special, just a simple N95 duck mask will keep you safe from the contaminants uh, when they're airborne. So what about uh, contaminants that are um, aerosolized or that you can get on your hands and skin? Um, what about transferring them to your sensitive mucous membranes? Well, that's where goggles come in. If you wear some goggles, you won't get any sprays of anything and you won't get the urge to, you know, jab your fingers into your eyes, which can lead to some actual exposure. So goggle up. Uh, 
especially if you're going to be handling anything for a prolonged period of time or if, if you know that there's uh, a lot of um, aerosolized contaminants around, putting on some goggles is a reasonable precaution. And it's something that should already be in your equipment from the whole Ebola scare from last year. And the last bit is taste. This is something that I gleaned from my security guard training that I underwent when I got my security guard card, where they say don't eat, lick, or taste anything while on duty to figure out what it is. Now, it seems obvious, but they spent an unusual amount of time on this. Uh, for a six-hour course, I'd say an unseemly amount of time was spent reinforcing this. Uh, I guess it must have been an issue, uh, otherwise they wouldn't have covered it in such great detail. But don't lick any powder to try and figure it out what it is. I know you see it in all those cop movies and uh, you know, shows where they stick a knife into it and pull it out and then lick it and say, oh yeah, this is this is uh, real uh, black tar heroin. Uh, you know, it's uh, probably about uh, 1.5 mil. Uh, you know, street value. No, don't don't do that. Just don't taste anything on duty to figure out what it is. It's it's generally not a good idea. So uh, that concludes everything. I, I hope you enjoyed the summation of uh, what. Narcan, what uh, fentanyl exposures can do to people and what anxiety attacks look like. We've compared the different set of symptoms so you can make your own decisions and be your own judge whether the symptoms that you're encountering in someone are really an, actually an opioid overdose toxidrome and, uh, or whether it's more of a anxiety or conversion related issue. It's really unlikely that you're going to get a significant exposure from fentanyl or heroin powder. Uh, I've explained the official position statements of all the um, you know, national experts on the topic. So if you happen to see someone who's experiencing symptoms, gently try and remind them that uh, they're probably going to be fine. But you know, I couldn't leave it at just that. I have to include some glib humor. So, to leave off today, I'm going to leave off on a video that I encountered of police officers on scene discovering fentanyl. Yeah. yeah.